I was so scared, not knowing what to expect and not knowing how long it was going to last and if he was going to be in pain and, and none of that happened. It, it went perfectly. He had no pain. He came out of it and when they brought him back to the room, I said, what do you want? He said, a kiss. <laughs> My husband gets very romantic when he's under. <laughs> And, you know, that's the way the whole thing started. And he was fine. I'm Joanne Vergona, and I'm here with my husband, Al, who has cerebellar ataxia. Good morning. My name is Al Vergona. I'm uh, 67. I've been diagnosed with cerebellar ataxia. I had the condition about five years. We've been here two weeks and he's had three treatments, one IV and two stem cell infusions. And we're hoping that his condition is going to get much better. We've seen some progress, hopefully more progress in his speech, which has not shown up yet. But uh, in physical therapy, he's done much better. Uh, I think he's walking better. And now we're waiting for the speech to come along. But he has three more treatments, so, and we'll be here two more weeks. Uh, the first indication of uh, any uh, problem came uh, when I was playing golf. My golf swing was getting worse. And uh, at my age, I just assumed that it was uh, a bad swing. So I took lessons. And uh, the lesson didn't help, and I found myself walking into uh, things that uh, I was just losing coordination. So my doctor recommended I take Tai Chi for balance. Uh, that didn't help either. So we eventually saw a neurologist who was diagnosed as uh, cerebellar ataxia. The uh, one of the symptoms that uh, I noticed right off the bat was uh, a lack of spatial judgment. In fact, uh, in driving, I found myself stopping before a stop sign or light uh, almost 100 feet. I was misjudging where things are in space. If I put something on a shelf, I would fall the shelf because I was actually putting on the edge of the shelf, not in the middle of the shelf. What else? Did I mention dizziness? The dizziness is, um, is with us now almost continuously, although it's not quite dizziness as one would consider uh, excessive alcohol, but uh, it's very similar to as ch children, if you uh, close your eyes and have someone spin you around and then stop and open your eyes and you, you go to take this up, you lose your uh, quite amount of disorientation. Well, that's what's with us all the time. Cerebellar ataxia is what I understand, and I know there's uh, now, I heard of uh, Emmanuel who has Joseph Mercado ataxia. Uh, multiple system atrophy. There's two patients here with that, which is really advanced. And he's not any of those, as far as I know, from what they've told us. But the way it was explained, it is not a diagnosis, it's a symptom of something that's going to happen. Well, so far nothing has happened. Blood tests are normal, everything. But the ataxia is progressing. It's difficult to say whether it's actually sped up or, sped up or not. Because in my way of thinking, we may have passed through a threshold of brain function where uh, the functions like speaking and uh, walking uh, not as good as if one had a few more neurons, it would still be acceptable. So I don't know, it's hard to say whether this is an acceleration or not. It's unbelievable. Uh, this disease, no one had heard of it. I had never heard of it. And the amazing thing is that every ataxia patient here in the hospital 
had the same thing. No one had ever heard of it. And we get here, and there's so many people with this condition. And they're not doing anything in the United States for it. We had to come to China. It's the only hope. And when you have no hope, you'll do anything. Uh, it has changed our life completely. We took care of my aunt, took care of my mother. My father lived the last three years of his life with us. And we were to the point, well, now it's going to be our turn. And now we're dealing with this. It, it has changed things dramatically. I used to be a researcher at one time, so data to me is very important. As I was telling you, very few people, this is off topic of course, but very few people retire uh, just uh, play cards and golf. Nowadays, we all look towards a second career. This uh, tech should, unfortunately has kind of uh, curtailed my opportunities in uh, pursuing the career, but uh, one of the other things about a texture which is really annoying is the uh, uh, fatigue every day. F around the afternoon, I just have to stop and uh, lie down, not sleep, but lie down for a few minutes. Uh, seems to help a little. There's nothing that really helps make it better. It's either the same or worse each day. So I'm hoping to see some uh, something go their way during this uh, course of treatments. You know the fatigue I think is fighting not to fall and to keep your balance and I've many people have suggested why don't you use a cane? We'll not do it, not yet, no. I, I think he feels that's giving in and he's not going to do that. So. We just have to wait and see. My husband has always been in charge. He ran a company in, for Kodak. He invented the product and then started a company which manufactured it and it was sold internationally very successfully for 10 years. And as he said recently, I'm not in charge of anything anymore. I have to do everything. He, he's not able to. Driving, which if he can survive my driving, he can survive anything. <laughs> but, um, and it bothers him. He's, he's not used to having other people do things for him. He's always done everything himself. And he's an artist, a wonderful artist. And now he holds on to the easel with one hand and paints with the other for how long, we don't know. We hope that's going to change and that he'll be able to continue with that. Well, I'm trained as an electrical engineer and uh, I ran the company for many years until I retired. And instead of, uh, no one re retires these days, especially, especially at a young age. So I took a watch and I'm now thought of as a professional artist. Unfortunately, with the texture, it's uh, becoming more and more difficult because it impacts the fine motor skills as well as balance, and I have to actually hang out to the easel with one hand while I'm painting. But since the fine motor skills have impacted, I've changed my style of painting to accommodate it, and uh, we think that the work has actually gotten looser and better, better, uh, more sellable, if you will. He's never satisfied with accepting whatever is, you know, in vogue at the time. He's always looking for a new way. That's what he's been in, in everything, in the artwork. He started by copying the masters. Bless you, Van Gogh, Renoir, I have some beautiful copies. <laughs> but that's how he learned. And from there, he developed his own style. I hope it continues. He is talented. I would hate to see that 
stop. Some of his detail in the early pictures he did, you would swear it was a photograph. I said, Al, loosen up. Well, now he has loosened up. <laughs> It, it is a looser, and it's changed. He, he's constantly evolving and always busy. And I think this has kept him from becoming depressed with this condition. I, I see no evidence of that, and I hope that never happens. Long as he can be busy working, you know, he can handle it. He did all the research as he always does. He's an electrical engineer, very focused, and the minute we got the word there's nothing that can be done, he was not going to take that. And he started researching and sent me everything that he found out on my email so that I could read it about Baker. And we had thought we would come in March next year until his speech and his condition started getting worse. He fell at the Y where we exercised. I said, Al, we're not going there anymore. You're staying home until we do something. I didn't want him to fall and break something. And he said, you know, I think we better go as soon as possible. So he contacted Baker and we got here November 13th. Actually, my own family physician was supportive of it. He's been my doctor for almost four years now. And uh, I think he has a, a curiosity to see what, what comes of this. But the neurologist was not uh, encouraging in this field. Yeah. I mean, we're literally, literally, literally the pioneers and uh, I'd rather be a settler, settler than a pioneer because they're the ones with the arrows in the back. So. But, I, but we couldn't wait, so we had to take the, take the leap. We've been to three neurologists. We went to Cleveland Clinic. There's nothing they can do except exercise, which he did diligently. However, that did not make much of a difference, and his condition kept getting worse. And in the last year is when his speech started going, very subtly in the beginning. And in the last three months before we came to China, it really progressed and it's difficult to understand him. By nighttime when he's fatigued, it is practically impossible. And this bothers him more than anything. He wants to be able to tell a joke again and win an argument with me, <laughs> which he can't do right now. The only uh, treatment options and frankly, I don't think they're very effective. Is CoQ10? In fact, one of the, the uh, fellow patients mentioned that uh, he improved his voice after taking CoQ10. Yeah. Massive amounts of it, and I'm a little leery that that's a good option for us. But other than that, there really isn't anything to be done yet. They tell you to yeah, you know, keep them, keep them less. In fact, exercising, uh, when I was younger, when we exercised, the muscles would respond either by getting stronger or bigger or whatever. Now, the, I don't seem to have any um, positive effects from the exercising. I don't gain strength or, or size. Well, what would happen if you didn't exercise? Well, that's the thing, you know. So we're just trying to maintain what we have. But I have to factor in my age too, which may account for some of this. I'm not 30 years old to respond to any someone in their, in their 60s, I think. Although this is a unique experience for me, since I was never 60 plus before. <laughs>